welcome to the consultant discussion. Um, we're talking about the 20 mistakes nonprofits made in 2018, lessons learned. My name is Tracy B. Allen. I am a nonprofit strategist and educator. I'm the owner of TVA Consulting and TVA Academy, where we help nonprofit leaders build and grow profitable, sustainable, and compliant infrastructure so they can achieve their mission, realize their vision through knowledge acquisition and strategic planning. Ty. Hey y'all, my name is Ty Boone. I'm a nonprofit success strategist. Y'all probably can't hardly see me because I'm I'm gonna level up. <laughs> hey, I bought one lightning. I bought one. So I'm gonna have to like hey, how y'all doing? Look, anyway. Um I again my name is Ty Boone, a nonprofit success strategist. I've been working with nonprofits for about 20 years. Um I started in the university and then um at a, a local nonprofit here in Birmingham, Alabama, where I am located. And I, I started consulting with nonprofits, small, underfunded, under experienced nonprofits. And that's what I do all day. That's all I have. Go producer. Um y'all are I don't know. I don't know how if I'm I'm gonna follow that up. But I'm gonna try <laughs> so uh, my name is Ranisha Strickland Roberts. My name is pronounced Ranisha. Although it looks like it's spelled Renessa, it's Ranisha. Uh, and I am the owner of Volcano Consulting. And we are a multidisciplinary company specializing in public health. Um, we also do a little bit of allied health and of course some, some things in the general industry, but our primary focus is public health. And we work with nonprofits, governments, um, other organizations, to provide education, training, management, technical assistance, capacity building. Um, we also provide some social science services. And we are a certified mi minority owned and women owned um, business in Central Florida. That's Nisha. I'm Latanisha Roberts. I am the owner of L. Roberts Consulting Services down in Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, I specialize in startup and development um, with a focus on smaller nonprofits, um, smaller and newer nonprofits. Um, startup and development is the area of specialty with um, grant writing services as well. Okay, awesome. All right. Oh, wait, let me let in the other people who are here. Okay. All right, so we're gonna get started. Um, who wants to start first? Um, so what we're gonna do, I, I think we have pr pretty much four categories that we're gonna mm -hmm. go through. Um, development and fundraising, formation, grant writing and consulting. Mm -hmm. um, or hiring a consultant. Mm -hmm. And so we'll try to tackle one topic from each of those categories and what we're calling rounds. And we have about seven rounds. So we're going to try to give you a spread of all the topics um, without doing them one topic at a time. That makes sense. So um, we can start with development and fundraising. And I'm not sure who wants to speak first on that. Hi. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, and that's like you know, right now, development and fundraising, I think, is the big thing right now. And most people are we, we said it development and fundraising, which is the way that it should go, development and then fundraising, right? But everybody trying to do fundraising first and then or either don't even worry about development at all. That's kind of like that's kind of what what we're saying. <laughs> I would have thrown in, you know, talked a lot about, you know, a lot about the building and strategic planning and things like that first, but since we're here on fundraising and development first, um, what I wanted to say is some mistakes that I see nonprofits making, again, is jumping in with fundraising first, really not understanding what fundraising is and what's that about, not coming up and creating a plan for fundraising. And really relying on fundraising as the only kind of one of the things that they do with grants as well relying on fundraising as the only source to get by so you see this time of year we're, we're towards the end of the year end of year giving 
when we see a lot of people with these wow frantic you know fundraising campaigns i need a dollar i need, you know, need five hundred dollars or whatever and just really not having a strategy with it so that's like the major thing that i see that's really going wrong right now and it kind of ties into development because the whole planning piece of fundraising i always tell people if you're not if you're not at the end of the fundraiser if you if you spent more money then you then you profited then you didn't raise funds right so that's not a fundraiser but coming together as a team with your board with your staff to figure out what what are you going to do what are you going to implement and how is this based on your mission instead of kind of being all over the place with your fundraiser i see a whole lot of that where people are kind of jumping from topic to topic you know really really just kind of mess mucking up their mission is what i would say yeah mission doing yeah, even even things like you know having coat drops and, and things like that when it's really not related to um, mm -hmm. mission right. that kind of takes your, takes your audience. And I always divide my audience into two two parts. You have your target audience, and I know Ronisha, I know you're you're public health, right? So we all we, we get that whole target on our mm -hmm. population. When I'm working with clients on fund development, I have in my own little, you know, tied terminology that my target audience are those people that we're trying to reach out to to support us. So mm -hmm. those funds, those because you're gonna have to tailor your message and tailor your approach differently than you would to your priority population, to those people that you serve, those people who don't necessarily have money to give to you, they're not really trying to support you. So we're jumping into fundraisers and really not knowing who we're reaching. You're like, you're, we're out there like, out, you know, I'm trying to raise $10,000, but I'm only sitting over here in my priority population. They ain't got no money. So, they, so they, you know, they're, they're the ones who are coming to us who are wanting us to serve them. So nine times out of 10, they're not going to have the $500 that you're asking for in your, in your, fund, in your campaign. Um, knowing who your target audience consists of, where to find them, what, you know, what they normally give to even if they want to give to what you're doing at all. So doing some research before you go out there with the fundraiser, that's what we're missing. Yeah, market research. Yeah. Like they completely forget about that part. And that's why I always go back to the fact that you're a business and any business that you're going into, it doesn't matter what business you're going into, you must do market research. Because without that, it, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, and that carries over into other categories of running your nonprofit you know you've got to know who you're targeting for that particular purpose that you've decided you need to target people for you've always got to do your research and i always say even if you're a part of the population that you want to serve don't make assumptions mm -hmm. you still need to research them yeah i agree so our next category is formation um who wants to tackle that one um i can say about formation mm -hmm. um i've heard a lot this year about owning nonprofits. um <laughs> founders think that they <laughs> own <laughs> the nonprofit organization and yeah like it's a public charity it can't be owned yeah we so, see that all the time <laughs> Ty and I, I know for sure. Well, I, I didn't know you don't own it. <laughs> yeah, but so when I my life up, it, so like, but I started it. I'm the founder. Right, but to me, that goes back to lack of education. Exactly. Because you started something that you didn't truly understand. Exactly. So then because you started it, you put the startup money, you're thinking it's like an LLC or a C Corp or an S Corp or sole mm -hmm. proprietorship where mm -hmm. you are the sole owner of it, not realizing that a nonprofit is a publicly owned it's a charity. charity. It yeah. Belongs to no one and it belongs exactly. to everyone. That's what I like to say. It belongs to no one and belongs to everyone but it doesn't belong to you. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. which is, I mean, for you, right? sometimes for some people, it's a bigger <laughs> pill to swallow, but it is just what it is. Yeah. So can we talk about the 1023 easy? <laughs> 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 so. Y'all, I'm telling y'all, this is why my light is dim because y'all are not supposed to see all these animations that I'm doing over here. I'm just, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, so the 1023 easy, has created a ripple effect 
in the nonprofit industry, and it's not a good one. It's one of quick, like, you know, that, that commercial where they said the easy button, who has that easy button? Is it Staples? Staples. Staples. I think. Yes. Staples. They're just pressing the easy button and they're getting the, um, they're getting these, um, nonprofits started, but because this form, this two page form does not really ask anything substantive, they're not doing the work necessary to formulate a solid foundation. Yeah. So one of the key pieces that we miss out is the business plan, which I'm very passionate about because you cannot run any business without a business plan. You must have a business plan. It's the roadmap to success. Without the business plan, how do you know where you're going and how you're going to get there? So I don't care what type of business. It could be making soaps in your bathroom, you know, um, cooking, um, fried chicken and um, Johnny cake, right? It don't matter. You need a business plan. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you need a business plan. You need something to tell you how you're going to get from point A to point Z and all the points in between that we tend to forget. Without it, you're just running blind, basically. So I just really want nonprofit leaders, founder executives, even if you have already started your nonprofit um, organization, sometimes we need to go back because even yes. us as consultants, we have to reflect on what's going on in our businesses on a regular basis. And if something isn't working, we may need to table it or we may need to reshuffle it so that it works for us. You have to do the same thing as a nonprofit. So if I'm telling you, you need a business plan and you're even a year in, two years in, five years in, it really doesn't matter. You now need to stop and go make a business plan. Sit with your board and create a business plan. If nobody knows how to do it because it can get a little technical, hire a consultant to come in and help you. But you need it because it's the mother of all the other business plans, of all the other plans that you're going to need. It is literally, that's the mama. And then the next one is the strategic plan and that's the daddy. And then it has a whole bunch of kids. So, yeah. One of the great that it has is the first thing we talked about, which is the development and fundraising plan. But that comes from that business plan because some of the elements you need is in that business plan. When you go talk about, oh, I need a grant writer. I need you to write a grant. The first thing, like one of the first things the grant writer should ask you about is where's your business plan? Mm -hmm. And where's your strategic yeah. plan? And then where's your development plan? So you need these things and they have to go in order. You can't skip anything along the way. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good segue into the next topic, grant writing. And, um, I think I'll be glad to tackle the, the first um, mistake here. Um, something that I tell people when I start to work with them is um, I really want them to shift the way they think about grant money being free. Um, it, in my eyes, it's not free. You pay for it in commitment, planning, execution, accountability, focus, um, you, you pay for it um, one way or the other, if you're going to keep it for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't keep it, then you're paying for it in a different way. So one of the, again, main ideas I try to get everybody to understand is that this money is not free. Yes, it's free in that you don't have to pay for anything to get this money, or ideally. Um, but you will, you will need to be prepared to pay for it in other ways. And another, and positioning is not easy. And that's, that's one of the things that I think, you know, as far as grants are concerned, that people coming in to nonprofits think that it's easy. And it's, you know, it, it's like, it's like the student. And it's overnight. Yeah, snap your fingers you know, and get it. <laughs> yeah, and we can do this. And I got this, you know, and I got this money all of a sudden to do whatever, to build a house, to, to get a transitional home, just nothing, nothing of substance, but I got my, my 1023 and now I got a grant and it doesn't, doesn't work like that. That's, I mean, it's 
year after year after year, no matter how much we scream it, no matter how, you know, how much chloroceptic spray I had to use because my drone is getting <laughs> sore, people still come in with the same thing. Hey, Ty, I got my letter. Can you write me a grant? And I'm like, it's like a big hole. Like, where's your, <laughs> where's your business plan? You know, where are, where are your programs? Where, what? Exactly. Yeah, what we got this we got this sandwich, right? You just got the top bread. We ain't even got the bread to go on the bottom. <laughs> like, you ain't got in the middle. We just walking around with a top bun. Right. Like, you got no hamburger. <laughs> I think there's a misconception right. that um once that five hundred one C three determination letter is in hand, that grant money is automatic. That's a huge right. that that is a huge and, and people really you know sometimes look confused when it's what's your program <laughs> like where is everything in between there is a whole in between section called development you know what I'm saying before you can mm -hmm. grant ready <laughs> right and, mm -hmm. and it's just that how many founders don't realize that True. right. I agree. Um, the whole misconception of getting the, um, you know, 501c3 letter from the IRS and thinking, okay, hey, I'm going to get yeah. it right now. <laughs> you know? And this is my letter. How much do I get? Right. Exactly. And, that's, it's, and then again, it goes right back to what I said again. Lack of education. Yeah. That's where it all stems from. Any of the issues that we are, we encounter on a regular basis happens yes. because of lack of education. And I, this is the first industry that I've ever seen that people get into and they don't educate themselves or don't think that they need to educate themselves or won't spend the money to educate themselves. I don't understand why. <clears throat> yeah. Anything okay. else that you're going to do, you're going to have to educate yourself. So that's true. Yeah. Um, to be successful, you will. Yeah. Um, the next topic is about what to expect when you're hiring a grant writer or a consultant. You should expect to pay me. That's right. The money. Yeah, to pay me because I don't work for free. Um, and and my fee doesn't come out of the grant funding. It's unethical. Um, but they really think that, you know, it's like a commission based thing. No, just expect to have a conversation about charges and payment mm -hmm. in the conversation, in the initial conversation, expect to pay me. <laughs> Absolutely. You, and it's, is like, um, Tracy was just saying this, this is another, in, is an industry where for some reason people don't expect to pay people actually call us and don't, don't expect, expect to pay, to pay anything <laughs> and because it's, it's, you're a non-profit and yeah. at least that's what it seems um yeah. I and think i personally try to keep my fees low but mm -hmm. i can't work for free right you know yeah so yeah that's i, a, I think that nonprofits are just so accustomed to getting a lot of stuff you know for free and cheap that when they come to us they just continue on the same mindset, you know, the same way of thinking. Okay, if I'm so, not not considering the fact that I got you know preschool to pay for or anything like that, because that's not their design. <laughs> They're just saying, okay, we got it, because we're a nonprofit and we are already under the misunderstanding that everything is supposed. to They don't want to pay for anything. It's not just us. They want you know where can I get somebody to do my website? Where can right. I, you know, right? Can I get free stuff for the, where can I get free furniture? Where can I get free? So they want to, you know, it's just kind of like that whole charity situation right. where they're, and then they, when they're not wanting to invest in it, but they still want the end result, you know, of as if they'd invested. And a lot of times they kind of, they get it crossed and we were talking about, I don't think we're talking about that yet, but we we're talking about formation and not really understanding what a public charity is, what it's about. And we have a lot of people who are founded organizations out of cash only uh -huh. and, and they're starting when they are, are themselves are in poverty are poor 
and, and really honestly cannot afford, you know, even us, and, and we'll be as low as we possibly can, I think that a lot of them should be advised to wait for mm -hmm. things if they, you know, if you want to be a founder, if this is your passion, go volunteer somewhere, go do something, go figure it out. You know, if you just need to just have this guy to serve and really can't afford to get it off the ground, because there are going to be some stuff that you have to invest in, yeah. like the plan, if you want it done right, you got to pay somebody to do it. Right. Um, I think you get to a certain level as far as grants are concerned, you know, those, the little bitty grants, and I tell people all the time, I don't like to, to, to have people pay me to write a thousand dollar grant, you know, because I right. feel like this level, you, you just really just kind of playing around. You just got to figure it out and get your feet wet. If you're an executive director, you should know how to write some basic level of grants on your own without paying anybody anything to do that. If you don't know how to do that, you need to learn how to do it. But when you move up, you know, you're moving up to state and federal funding. You need, you need to get an expert in there, you know, because yeah. you just, you know, everybody is lost right there. You know, <laughs> everybody's lost right there. <laughs> but when, <laughs> really, but when you're, when you're starting out and you're getting you know, Walmart, that's practice for you. As an executive director, you need to go out there and practice writing those little requests for sponsorship or whatever it is so that you can know what you're talking about in regards to your organization. If you're the executive director of your organization and you're the founder of your organization, you're supposed to know more about your organization than I do. You're supposed to know more about your organization than Ronisha does. I mean, she, she's just a giver, you know, to, to create whatever this proposal. But you're supposed to be the smartest cookie there. As the executive director, and I see what I see a lot of founders doing is just starting off passion, jumping into the executive director role because they, you know, a lot of them are expecting some kind of salary or just like the title you know, director, but not really educating themselves in regards to leadership. You know, what does it take to run a nonprofit? What does funding look like? What do I need to know as an executive director in order to run my organization or run this organization because I'm not sure to run this organization effectively. They're not doing that. We're kind of missing that whole piece where we go from the determination letter to, oh, I'm the executive director, to now I'm here for money. But what do you do, you know, personally to prepare yourself to be the executive director of this organization? Right, good. And I just want, I just want to piggyback really quick on what, you know, when we're saying we need to be paid, first we mean that. But um, we're, we're not we're not being facetious. We're not yeah. picking on anybody. We uh, like again a lack of education has made people think that they can call us and ask for our services for free, um, not realizing that a grant can take tens of or hundreds of hours to complete. Exactly. And um, you know, t in our world, time really is money. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody here is trying to be rich, but we're, we're in business. To we're in money. the wrong business to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. I got to say some it works or something. I don't know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, we're on to round two? Yeah, round two. And next we have social media fundraising pitfalls. Tracy, I think this one is Don't yours. Tracy. Yeah, go Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Social media pitfalls and fundraising. Well, in 2019, I would really, really, really like it if you got to stop doing Facebook fundraisers. You should only have two Facebook fundraisers per year. These micro fundraisers that you're constantly putting out are fatiguing your audience. It is too much. And I seriously mean that. No marketing strategist will tell you that that's okay. It is not okay to constantly, it makes your organization look hungry. It makes, it, it makes your organization look as if you are not handling your funds correctly so you're always needing to raise funds and most of the fundraisers i see on social media are not for let's raise fifty thousand dollars and let's run a long campaign to raise fifty thousand dollars i don't have a problem with that 
have a, you have a, a budget and you're engaging your audience in the right way. But when you're trying to raise five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars, like what are you really doing with that money? Like, how much impact are you truly making for your organization with what most people use to pay their car note every month? You understand what I'm saying? So if you're going to have a fundraiser, have a fundraiser with a real purpose. Let the audience know what your purpose is for this fundraiser and make it substantive because it needs to be in order for me to buy in to the fact that you need this money. Why do you only need $200? Like, that doesn't make sense. I look at that and I go, hmm, what's going on here? And I know and most of us look at it and we go, hmm, there's some, there's a problem. Yeah. Because I always, you cannot run a nonprofit organization on 200 or 500 or $2,000. If you tell me you're raising $50,000, I'm going, okay, she needs the money to do something with. <laughs> you know, he needs the money. Now that, that doesn't mean if you need 2000 ask for 50000 tomorrow. Right, no. That's not, that's not what she's saying. <laughs> that is not what Ask for what you want, but when you ask, you're asking for $2,000 this month, you may get it. The next month I see that you have a fund, another fund. Sometimes the month isn't even over. And I see you have another yeah. fundraiser for yeah. $2,000. I mean, so let's say $200. And then two weeks later, you have another one of $4,000. Like, what's going on? We have and I think they that. don't realize they have to be able to show. There's a thing called transparency. Mm -hmm. Um. You have to be able to show what you're doing with this $2,000 every month. I know what you're saying, Tracy, and I agree with you on that. Um, it makes you wonder how the money is being handled. What's the money being used for? Right, because it, it, it makes it look like you're, you didn't have a proper plan. Exactly. Right. We're, not, we're not saying that's always the case, but that is the perception. The that's the perception, exactly. Yeah. And then what, what happened? Oh, sorry, Ty. <laughs> to diversifying your funding efforts so if you're doing this fundraising what else are you doing if you're raising, if you're raising $20 book, where's your book? go ahead I'm about to say, where's your you know where's your board in the mix of all this and your the support that's supposed to be your backbone for your organization when you're in here raising $50 and it just looks bad you know it's just like you in a in your house in your own house and you're out there. And say, well, I need a hundred dollars this month for my light bill, and I need a hundred. I need a two hundred dollars next month. And you do a you do a cash out go fundy or whatever mm -hmm. every other month or to take care of your the internal workings of your home. It's the same thing. So what, where's your internal your your board and, and people like that who are supposed to be there to guide you along to make sure that this basic stuff that you're on. Facebook raising money for is already taken care of. You know, it's about the, the infrastructure and not setting it up like it's supposed to be set up. So you wouldn't have to go back repeatedly every day to fatigue your donor base, you know, asking for $25 every day. Because mm -hmm. once you get with them, they're going to be on some type of cycle of giving anyway. So it wouldn't be a problem. Right. And then the other thing with Facebook fundraisers is that Facebook does not give you access to the donor information. So they're not giving you like a database of who donated their email addresses and that type of stuff. So well, you can follow up, but it is going to cost you a lot of time. You need somebody dedicated to your Facebook fundraiser. So when you Facebook fundraiser, there is a way to follow up. But like I said, it's very arduous. You are going to have to catch the first, catch the, the list that comes up, that little notification that tells you such and such, like Ty Boom, um <clears throat> donated to your organization. So you're going to have to reach out to Ty via inbox or yeah. on Facebook then you're going to have to cajole her to joining your um, email list. You know, there is a way, but it's work. It's a lot of work. So yeah, we need the best bet is to have a fundraiser off of Facebook that you have control over, that you're collecting that, um, that demographics, th that, th that type of data from the donors so that you can continue to build a relationship with them and turn them in, 
turn them from transactional donors into annual donors. You know, people who are giving to you continuously. And that's the pop. That's one of the other problems I see with the Facebook fundraising. It is a transactional process. It is not a relationship building process. And I think we can all agree that nothing happens in a, a nonprofit organization unless you learn how to build some relationships. Nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the. That's like one of the foundations of a successful nonprofit organization is building a nurturing relationships because those are the things that you're going to need to leverage in order to move forward so yep. i think there i think some people are so desperate to start getting the funds that they're really not thinking about building Look, facebook is not the place for that because they don't get that money sometimes for three months Six oh, yeah. months yeah. together. Yeah. There's nowhere to track it. <laughs> you know? But yeah, I mean, you just wait and check in your mailbox and you're like, oh, where did this come from? But it's all started to put a cash app out there, y'all. The cash app. Cash app. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> not a cash app. <laughs> they start putting the cash app out there so they can get it right then. I promise y'all. They put the cash app out there. I'm telling y'all, Giving Tuesday. I was giving Giving Tuesday thing and they had cash app up there. Really? No. Yeah, <laughs> everybody is doing this cash app thing. I am so tired of seeing cash app. Yeah, for nonprofits. I've seen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what else. It's just like it. it's, it's a desperation. They don't I have think the desperation <laughs> that fundraising. It's like GoFundMe. You know, that was that's a desperate situation. You know, for a lot of people, and and what you have to learn is that we can't do everything out of desperation, and that's what. That's why we skipped the development piece right there because I, need, you know, JG Wentworth, I need cash and I need it now. I need it right now. So I ain't got time to, I ain't got time to be, you know, you know, no development. I ain't got time for, for the, you know, for people to. But that's my what makes people look unorganized is when you work from a place of desperation. Everybody, people, it's like hair. people are like animals. They're like dogs. You know how dog dogs can smell fear. We smell desperation. We're like. Hmm. Something's not right over here, <laughs> you, 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 you know, because you can see the desperation <laughs> in the marketing strategy, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> um, our, next, our next category is back to formation and someone, whoever wants to speak to types of 501c3s and business structures. And then something I've been seeing a lot lately is people asking about subsidiaries or people who have a for-profit and a non-profit and they want to make those work together. Um, so who wants to handle this one? Tracy, I want you to take the 3LC, the L3C. Yeah, because we just, it's just, <laughs> can you take that, can you take that, please? You, she said can you that take it, girl, because I'm, I need some, I got some water right here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I need so when we're talking about subsidiary, subsidiaries, um, there are three types of, okay, so let's back up a minute. So when you have a for-profit business and you want to make a nonprofit entity with the for-profit or you have a nonprofit and you want to make a for-profit entity, that works you need to see a lawyer first of all because that is a complicated business structure okay mm -hmm. and a lot of things can go very wrong along the way yes. especially especially okay. in the accounting department because mm -hmm. if that money ain't right you're in trouble <laughs> okay <laughs> <quite late. laughs> right so, if you are a for-profit, a non, let's first start with a non-profit. A non-profit business, yes, can have a for-profit entity under them, a subsidiary under them. But you must, don't come to me as the consultant. Come to me after you've already formed it. But to form it, you must see a lawyer. Do not do it yourself. You must go to a lawyer. And you do not want to do it until you are making money where the um for the nonprofit is self-sufficient mm -hmm. so don't think that oh wow well my nonprofit is struggling so let me go 
over here and do a four. No, you can't even manage what you already have. Why are you going to add to the fire? It's just going to get very complicated and you're going to end up in jail. And we don't want to visit anybody in jail and I'm not going to jail either. So. I'm going, but um, maybe not. I can't go down there. So, and then there are for profit businesses that want to have a charitable um, entity attached to their for profit. So in some states currently, they have tried to streamline that process for for-profit businesses. So one of the things you can start is an L3C, which is a, a low, oh gosh, help me know, a low income liability organization, yeah, right? So, or you can start a B Corp or a, um, was B Corp and a B, why am I not carrying that now? A B corporation and a B corp, right? So they're both, all three of them are, that's the easiest way to start a for-profit business that has a charitable, a charitable entity attached to it because you can make as much money as you want to make in it but your primary mission has to be charitable. You cannot get grants. You cannot. That is not something that happens. So if you're going to start an L3C or you're going to start a B Corp or any of that stuff, you cannot. You're not eligible for grants because you are not a nonprofit organization. You are not a 501c3 tax exempt organization. So if you're going to start that, then know that you cannot apply for grants. What you can do is reach out to foundations and they can determine whether or not they want to take the risk in um, giving you or lending you money. They can determine, they can take it out of their 5% that they have to um, give by law every year. Um, they want to make an investment in your programs. And they can do that by either giving you the money, a small amount of the money, or they can loan you the money at a very low interest rate, or they can loan you the money with no interest rate. But they can do that because they, by law, have to give 5% of their, their income to um, nonprofits anyway. But they're not going to give you a grant. You're not eligible for grants but they're making an investment, a risky investment in your organization. Does that mean that because you're an L3C that you're going to get it? No, it doesn't. It's just like anything else, you have to prove yourself. Where is the data to back up that you can do what you say you're going to do and be successful at it? And they want to see what your income is, you know, making sure that, you know, you're not in a situation where you're just looking for money to spend their money on, like some people do when they get grants, they don't use the grant money for what it's supposed to be used for, and then you end up in trouble. So there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration when you're going to start one of these companies. But like I said, it's not everywhere. There's only at 13 states where you can start an L3C right now. Not, so not every state has adopted um, the L3C model, but for the states that have adopted it, it's been working well for them and they've done so so that they can streamline the process because it was a legal nightmare and even lawyers didn't want to touch it. So, yeah. Awesome. Ty, did you want to add something? I forgot. <laughs> five, five, three type, 501 types. You're breaking up. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Anyway, there are like five types of public charities, and then you have 27 different types of nonprofits. And what people, I, what people, I think, really don't know, because people come in, they won't like. They want like NFL money, right? <laughs> They're like, I heard that the NFL was a nonprofit and 
They got bills done. They get paid and oh, boy, sit down. Because <laughs> what, what you do not understand is, is that there are various types of nonprofits. And, and what I deal with is the 501c3 public charity. There's also private foundations. And public foundations kind of fall into that, you know, we're we're public charity where we can take your donations and blah blah blah. But we are at least likely to get grants. No, normally private foundations can't get them, like very, very rarely get get grants. But in private foundations are normally founded by families, usually have their own money. People are, you know, coming in like, I want a, I want a foundation like Will Smith and Alicia Keys. Don't y'all know they got their own money? Oprah Winfrey is funding this organization, right? She ain't asking for no grants. She's calling me. I wish. But she don't need to call me, right? She don't need to call me and ask me to write a grant because she has the money. Her friends have money. So they're doing their private foundation. They're doing this thing where where they can be the face and they can be the, you know, they can be the funder and they can get their friends together and fund this thing. But when you're talking about public charity, you're talking about something like United Way or Salvation Army, where I don't even know who the founders of those the organizations, I don't know what they look like. And see, we see a lot of times where a lot of you guys come and you're like, okay, I'm the founder. I want everybody to know I'm the founder. I want to take my glamour shot. This is about me. And you can, and you get back into that whole ownership thing because you're confusing the type of business that you have with what a public charity is supposed to look like. A public charity does not look like you. A public charity looks like the people you serve. So what I would like to see going into 20, 2019 is more of the people you serve, more about those, not about, and I mean, it's okay if you want to take your picture and put it on Facebook, I'm fine. I'm not telling you not to take your picture of it. But when you think about public charity, I would be more willing to give and to support what I see you doing out in the community, in the public, than I would to see I'm tired of seeing you taking your glamour shots because it's not about you and you make it look like it's about you. And then you want to get a grant. So it's like, what is this grant for? Is it to help you buy your next photo shoot? I don't know. <laughs> is, it for, is it to serve these people? I don't know. So you want, you know, you want to know what it is you're starting. If you're looking for a private foundation, which a lot of you, a lot of you guys really are, like when you're starting, you're wanting to do something more like a private foundation or something more like, um, what Tracy just sp spoke about, but you want the grant. Mm -hmm. So you to kind of go ahead and decide, well, let me go ahead and, and, and just do it this way because I want a grant. And you're thinking that grants are going to help me support my life and do whatever. So I'm going to do a public charity, but I want to run it like something else. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. You have to make a decision at formation, you know, at this, which is why I, I like the long form so much better mm -hmm. than the short form. Because it makes you think and it, it gets you to really, really consider where your funding is going to come from, you know, who is going to, if you're trying to pay people, who is going to be paid, what that looks like. It helps you really to decide, should this be, should this be the thing that I'm doing? And do I really want a public charity? A lot of people, by the time they get through those 30 pages in that long form, they're like, look, I don't want to do this. I ain't even want to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the long form. The yeah, the long form. Twenty three. Is the short form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the short form. So the short form is the easy. That's the streamlined application, mm -hmm. which is it's two, it's three pages in all. But the first two pages are are the pages. And the last page is like a signature page. You know, just yeah. <laughs> they added one relevant question to that page. Um, recently, in the yeah, the beginning of two thousand eighteen. Yeah. They added that. They added just you know one or two little questions. What's your mission? I think it was what's your mission or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Or what are your activities? What kind of activities are you trying to do? And something I don't I can't yeah. even remember. But it's not anything of substance at all because people are just wanted. You know, it asks questions about whether or not you have organizing documents. People don't have their bylaws and they're saying, Yeah, I got them. You just checking off. Yeah, checking check boxes. Yeah. yeah, it's literally just check boxes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. and then celebrating. Hey, I got my, I'm approved, but then not even knowing the difference between private foundation and public charity or whatever else you're doing. You just know you got the determination letters. I wanted going to 2019 just to understand what it is you're forming when you form. If you're wanting to form, if it's a public charity, it is for the people by the people. It's about service, service first. So if you're wanting it for anything, if, if you just think for two minutes that it's about you, it's about your personal gain, you're trying to figure out your salary off the top, 
don't do it. Just just right. go ahead and go over here and get your LLC or do whatever you got. <laughs> do some, do some you can still, you I, I think what a lot of people fail to understand is that you can still be very helpful. You can make an impact without mm -hmm. being a nonprofit organization. Yes. You do not yes. have That's to very be good a point. nonprofit in organization in order to make impact in your community so mm -hmm. that's an element. and i know people always ask this why are we always saying stuff like that if we're nonprofit consultants is because yeah, we, no don't want to see you fail. <laughs> <coughs> we don't want to see you fail and i don't think any of us are on here who um are going to take people's money just to take their money when we know that they're setting themselves up for failure so yeah, yeah. Some of, some people don't want to hear the right way though. Well, yeah, they, yeah, what, yeah, what was that they told us, Ty. We were what? I we guess people get about. upset with me. What? What were we? Oh, they <laughs> do that. They do that to me too. They they, they, they some people do get upset by. Yeah, uh, they get upset. They don't want to hear the right way. Um, they don't want to hear that. Oh, well, maybe you should start an LLC and not a nonprofit because yeah. nothing that they're saying is service based. And like Ty said, if it's not about service, then right, right, or that's going to take know. longer than they it goes anticipate. Back to, yeah. yeah, and they think that they think that nonprofit automatically means yeah. grant yeah. funds, and if sad to say it's sad but true that a lot of people start nonprofits based that with yeah. absolute wrong yeah like the intentions are not pure mm -hmm. it's really really about their need or their want or whatever for money and it's sad when you but i have to be real because i can't yeah. service someone i can't do that um knowing that you're in it for the wrong reasons right. if that makes sense mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. we spent a long time on that mm -hmm. yeah y'all let me talk about formation because i'm like look <laughs> it's like look i want to get a grant i don't care because i don't have to they feel like they don't have to work for the grant but if you get a, a for-profit business then we all have for-profit businesses right so you know like you got to get up and go like i don't even i don't even want to talk to this client today but i got to talk to them anyway i got to create this uh, i got to do this i got to right. you, you, you're knowing that you have work like you have to produce in order to get it's like okay well i got to write, write this grant it's like four o'clock in the morning i'm up here trying to write this grant i'm just yeah. typing whatever on television i gotta start over again whatever <laughs> you know you gotta, you know you got to do this work but a lot of people who get into nonprofits think they only think grants and that's all they see and they think it's a thing and they think okay well somebody's gonna write me a check i'm gonna get a grant and there's nothing that i have to produce for it right. Which is thing, but they're thinking there's nothing I, have to produce. I was i think i mentioned to you guys before where i've seen people who had proposals written like they were really pretty really pretty proposals i mean if i was a funder that didn't know any better i would give them some money but <laughs> Their actual, they don't have anything, any actual, any anything. Okay, yeah. your people, your budget looks like this, but you ain't even got no bank account, so this is a lie right here, right? So we don't know. So this is not true. But you have people thinking, hey, the proposal is just you're you're writing this, and it, it doesn't have to be real. There's right. I, I call. I say that that some people think we're wizard storytellers. They, 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 oh, yeah. they think we can just come up with it all and make it sound really good and we're really yeah. our job is to just tell a story and we do we we are there to tell a story but we're there to tell uh a concise and um true. really detailed story <laughs> that's true, true. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. i've had people <laughs> ask me well can't can't you just put this? And then this is the right. other thing about that, that people I think don't readily understand is that sure, if I'm the type of grant writer that's going to write a lie and you happen to get the grant, what's going to happen when you actually have to do what you said mm -hmm. that you were going to do? Mm -hmm. There's a flip okay. side to that coin. If we write it, most funders are going to hold you to everything. To exactly. you they are going to expect you to do everything you said you were capable of doing mm -hmm. so we have to 
paint a truthful picture in these proposals. It's, it's not as simple as make it sound good or make it look good. What my job is, is to take the information you've given me and put it in a format that is expected by a grant reviewer or a funding agency um, and, and have the details that they're looking for in the format that they're asking for it in. And you know, being really specific with those details and um, understanding how to put those things together. So you tell me your story, I reformat that story because it's going to a particular audience and maybe you don't speak the same language that I do, so I can translate it to them. That makes sense. But you, you have to do what you say you're gonna do in that grant. If you don't, you're either gonna have to give the money back or you're never gonna, they're never gonna fund anything else you, you ever do. And that's if you, you stay away from fraud. You may have bigger consequences. <laughs> okay, so um, one more, um, the last category here, round two, is uh, working with consultants. And then maybe we can have a Q&A, see if anybody has any questions. I know we've been talking a lot. Um, but this one is on um, ideal or baseline prices for grant writing and nonprofit consultants. What should people expect? Let me go. So, so I, I've, I've, um, what I hear the most is there's an hourly rate that people are paid hourly. Um, but I also heard people who charge by the project. So they may look at your, your grant um, instructions or RFP or notice of um, announcement and they figure out how long it's going to take them, what resources they're going to have to put into it. Um, what any uh, supplementary or auxiliary items that they're going to have to add to your application, those kinds of things, and they come up with a a, a, a one-time price for that um, as opposed to hourly price. Um, I even heard someone told me the other day that they charge a daily rate, which is a little unfathomable for me, but they like it. It works for them. Um, so you can, when it comes to how consultants charge you you should expect just about anything that's up to the individual consultant and how they feel um, th what's the best structure for them when it comes to fees um, I think you should probably you ladies you can jump in and I think <laughs> expecting to pay somewhere between 50 and 75 dollars an hour is a good expectation you'll find prices outside of that range on either side but um i think that's a good place to start when you're thinking about whether or not you can afford a, a consultant uh what what is some of your ladies you ladies experiences yeah i um i, I do a look kind of like a little mixed you know depending on what the what the rp looks like um like i said depending on what's involved how much I know about the client, if I know for a fact that they're missing a whole lot of stuff, I do a little prayer, you know, <laughs> and I ask the Lord if you want me to accept yeah. <laughs> Lord, cause sometimes I, sometimes I won't, you know, there's a lot of times I, I won't accept yeah, the prize. Yeah, and, and, and know that consultants have the right to do that, just like you, have, just like the client has the right to decide whether or not they want, want the client. I've, and depending on what um, you know, what the what the project entails, and how prepared the client is going into it, and how much they're willing to put into it to help me. Prepare. So there's a lot of things that you know, like budgets and, and program pieces. I look at those. You know, I have a, a lot of times I'll do a base rate depending on what the who the funder is, and then I'll charge. You know, depending on what they have prepared as far as the program and the budgets go. But, um, folks just don't have those pieces together just don't have them together and not really knowing that they're supposed to but have a good grab you know a good grasp of services and know what they're doing as far as what their delivery looks like but just don't have it you know presentable enough to work with and not some you know sometimes but that is an additional service like program design and things like that is additional yeah. service 
Uh, most of the time, I would I'll charge a base, and then I'll do an hourly, you know, seventy-five dollars an hour after the base, depending on what the project is. Um, again, for small grants like you know, corporate, uh, a lot of community grants. Um, I don't set it like that. But when we get to bigger grants, state and, and federal funding, you got to pay me a base because I need to. If I'm if I'm gonna lose three weeks of work for you, I need to. I need to. I need, and, and I'm serious yeah. about losing three weeks of work. But working with one yeah. client takes a lot of time. When you're talking about big proposals, because you have to wait on them a lot of time to send you stuff. You've got to do research, and you're turning down other clients um, when you're really and you have to focus. And you also want to know. One, and I don't know if we if that's another round or not. But when you're looking for a grant writer. You know, kind of find out what their mojo is. Like for me, I right. re my background is in HIV education, minority health. So if you're if you have a an RFP for that, I could probably take that and write it in my sleep. Like wake up yeah. in the morning and I got to <laughs> like yeah, girl, I did it. You know, because that's where the bulk of my experience is. So for the other things, if I'm not that familiar about it, I got to research it. I got to learn about it. You know, things like that. I can propose, so it may take a little bit longer um, to get done, depending on who the funder is. Yeah, and sometimes even, I know for me, there's been times when I'm very familiar with a particular topic or industry, but I still have to do a lot of research because it's a fast moving industry. It's always changing. Um, there's a new law or there's, you know, something new implement there's a project i'm working on now where i have to be considering you know the laws about telling calling people on the telephone you know and the some things that have changed in that that realm so it's a good idea for us to always you know do a little research and we may have to do more depending on what the circumstances are mm -hmm. even when we're familiar mm -hmm. and you want your clients to be in my let's go back to what i was saying about executive directors, you know, even program directors, whatever, you want them to be involved in continuing education. I, I cannot understand why you would leave an organization and not educate yourself about your population, but you, go, but you give it to the grant writer. You know, back to what you were saying about what to do with this. If you get funded, what do you do? Because you didn't know anything about, you didn't know what the trends were. You didn't know what changed. You don't, you have to know the rules. <laughs> yourself so you have to be involved in continuing education not just about knowing where the money is but knowing what's going on with your population so that you will be the you're the best organization to handle the grant when the grant comes along when you're proposing this is why i'm the best organization for this because we did this this and this and i know right. what the trends look like i know what's next so i know if we're, if we're no longer funding for treatment there's going to be funding for for you know, for education of it in, in two years. So let's go ahead and work this out. Where we're closing up this, we're closing up this, this proposal, and they know that we know this. So they know that hey, it's gonna be somebody that's gonna be continuing. This is for a long term because they are educated about the population. That's the best way to get funding and start to consistently because you're going along with with the trends in your in the area. Right. So all of those things factor into how many hours it's gonna take me to complete your mm -hmm. proposal. <laughs> and I mean, it's, we're not on that topic, but based on what Ty says, I wanna interject something where we're talking, education is a continuous- Recurrent theme, theme. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a continuous theme here. And something that Ty said, so if you're dealing with like AIDS, right? That's your organization is to help um, get medication to people who um, have AIDS or, you know, help them get treatment, whatever it is, right? You need to go to AIDS conferences. You need to be up on what's going on. You have to be constantly in a professional development type setting because things change so much yeah. in that one industry, like you say, and you know you have to continuously know what's going on, how is it changing, how is it affecting what you're doing in your organization, what you need to change in your organization in order to keep up with it. So um, professional developments is something that you need to write into your strategic plan yes. and how much money it's gonna cost you every year 
for these professional developments, your board, because I think we're getting to government soon. Um, so I'll just say it now, like your board needs to have at least two or three professional developments every year, and maybe a retreat. Like you have got to educate your populace. When you get um, volunteers that come in to help your organization, you have got to train them. Like yeah. education, I mean, no matter what you're doing, you have got to teach people how you do stuff. Like yeah. I know that when you go on a job, they say, oh, but you've done this job before. No, I did this job for someone else. So their systems and processes are different to your systems and processes. So you Excellent still need to train me. It doesn't matter if I've been doing the job for 20 years or 30 years. I didn't do the job for you. So, yeah. Awesome. That's just my little tip. Uh, just, just a quick <laughs> piggyback on that. The other mm -hmm. thing is about professional development is it will show in your grant proposals, too. Mm -hmm. Because um, you can... you. A lot of grant um, RFPs, when they're asking for you to make your proposal, they're asking for innovation, yeah. um, mm -hmm. something that implements technology, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And if you are, I have, I literally, I'm also re review federal grants. And sometimes when I review grants, people are literally doing things that they were doing 30 years ago and they're still writing grants saying that this is how they're going to do it and as a reviewer all of us are like wait <laughs> hold up <laughs> um, yeah we don't need you to bring that up to date you know so again you have to stay out there and you have to continue to um and there are foundations in every state that will give you grants for technology. Yeah. You just have to know who they what the foundations are and how they work. Get to know people, building relationships again, nurturing those relationships mm -hmm. to get the grant that they will give you to bring your systems up to date. Right. And okay. I sit on one of those foundations. So I can tell you, like, if you don't get to know some people, no, you just don't. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> All right, anybody have questions? If you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask. Nobody? We have Helena, we have Patricia, and we have Albert. Albert's been here since 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> No. Are they? Could they be having trouble unmuting themselves? Um, I don't think so. No, I was just checking the chat to see. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, I guess. We can right, keep on on. On. So the next one is partner partnerships, and under that we have things like subcontracting, sub awardees, and learning how to pool resources. Now, this is a big one to me, <laughs> <laughs> especially the pool and resources part. Um, so some people don't know that, um, you may, you may be able to subcontract your nonprofit services to either another nonprofit or a government entity, um, or anybody. Mm -hmm. You may be able to stay within your mission and provide the services that you provide and get paid for it, um, mm -hmm. as a subcontractor. So that's a possibility. Um, or you could be a sub awardee of someone else's grant. Uh -huh. um, and later on, I think we're going to talk about fiscal sponsorship. That's a whole different, uh -huh. whole different um, animal. But if you are a sub awardee, that usually means that someone came to you before the grant was written and said, hey, you know, we don't really provide this service, but we think that your service would be a good fit for what we're trying to, to get grant funding for. This is a missing piece in our program. So we want to add you to our grant and work together to provide, you know, these services. So you may, so they may be awarded the grant and then by virtue of them being awarded and you having a partnership um, with them, you may be a sub awardee. Um, I'm on, I'm on, anybody else want to talk about pooling resources? I, 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 that's a course I just keep beating. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm trying to hold all of mine until we get the board governance. But as far as partnerships go, I just think it's important for um, leadership and executives to understand that number one, it expands your reach. You can just reach more people. And I know from working with United Way, um, they actually sometimes require it, particularly A lot if. Of us do. If there's an organization that's already doing um, what you're wanting to do, they want to see you partnering with that organization, especially if they fund that organization. They're not going to fund um, right. one or they want to see a partnership. And it's just, I mean, you can just expand your reach by, by so many people, um, by partnering. Um, partner with another organization. So you can, you can expand your reach and reach more people and provide more services, yeah. but you can also do it at a lower cost awesome. if you're partnering yeah. with other yeah. agencies who are doing things that are complementary to your mission. Um, and these are things that funders are looking at. We're not just talking about these things. Mm -hmm. These are the things that they're looking for when they're scoring that proposal that you're having us write. So we need to have a plan for that ahead of time a real plan not yeah. just a real plan, but a real intention yeah i saw the question yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so i think she wants to know more about subcontracting so mm -hmm. what i mean is um let's i'm i'm in i'm in the state of florida um and just about anywhere you what i i do for my for-profit business and um what i've done for some nonprofit businesses is write proposals for like government entities um, or other organizations. Um, and the way that I find those opportunities are usually through emails or listservs or searching the internet. Um, but I have a, a client uh, in Miami who has two contracts. We wrote, wrote the contracts. They happen to be, she has a mentoring program. Both contracts have to happen to be for mentoring and related services that she already provides and so it's not exactly a grant um, the legal terminology and the legal requirements are different but she is a nonprofit who is a contractor for the state of florida now mm -hmm. to provide mentoring services for you mm -hmm. in the area that she's in so um again here in florida we have kind of a statewide <laughs> system where you can, you can uh, go online and see what contract uh, bids are open and you can apply for them. You, of course, as always, you need to read the instructions of the RFP to be uh. sure that you actually qualify. <laughs> but um, that's another way um, to be able to meet your mission and do exactly what you do um, a lot of the time. And it's something other than grant funding. Right. Yeah, every state has that you know, that system that you're talking about, you can go online. Uh -huh. um, crazy. Yeah, there's lots of them online. We saw this, and I, I wanted to make sure that people understood this as well. Um, I saw something on Facebook or something where an individual um, had a for-profit business or something, or maybe she was a freelancer or whatever, uh -huh. um, and she was consulting. And she wanted to offer her consulting services through her nonprofit, through their nonprofit organization. I remember. But 100% of the income. I'll see y'all doing that in 2019 because y'all go to jail. So that's not, that's not what I wrote into this thing. <laughs> right. When you have your organization or your company actually contract with another or organization or agency not the individual and this person was doing this because they were trying to to create for themselves a salary yeah um but they were doing some freelance i think it was freelance work maybe as a consultant and yeah under the impression that they could do that through their the nonprofit. 100 percent of the income yeah it's, and it's people not, were in that that chat telling her yeah you can do it yes yeah yeah Lots of I, I think that the other thing people may not understand is that you, when money comes into a nonprofit, it has to be used within that nonprofit for the yeah. services oh. that are provided by that nonprofit. Uh -huh. Everything has to go back to your mission. And uh -huh. the mission statement is super important be, for, for one reason, because 
you have your the services you provide have to fall under that mission mm -hmm. and so you can't just decide to pay for things mm -hmm. or to hire people to do things that don't serve your mission right and i think one of the other things that a lot of people tend to forget is that when a foundation or the state or the federal government whoever gives you a grant you have something called a grant report that you need to write Ooh, yeah. um, so <laughs> on that report you need to account for every single dollar that you spent they yes. need to know how much money were spent um <laughs> so down to the last penny yes Not, you can't be missing two cents you have to balance that budget sheet yeah you better um yeah. And they need to know how you use the money, what program, if did you use the monies for the programs and services that you said you were going to um, use them for. And usually a lot of them want to know what's the impact. Yeah. So right. they're not just giving you the money and then, whoop, that's it. You know, you have to account for the monies that were given to you. So exactly why grant money is not free. Exactly. <laughs> somebody needs to manage it. <laughs> Reporting will make you decide not to, not to have a nonprofit as right, well. Right, exactly. And that a lot is. of them leave that reporting up to the program manager, but sometimes the program manager is already overwhelmed with running all of the aspects of the program. So sometimes you really need to hire a manager, depending on how big your organization is, to make sure that the monies are being allotted. And you have to sit down with the program manager and the ED, and you have to create a plan of how you're going to spend this money. You just don't throw it into the pool and then everybody just pull from it whenever they want to. It has, how much are we spending on books? How many are we spending on teachers? How much are we doing, you know, when it comes in? Even though, yes, that has been written into the grant, you still need to go over the process when the monies actually do come in. Right. And you, you have a spend down grant. So if you get a spend down grant, how are you going to supplement when you only get the money in portions because one phase has to be completed before you get the money for the next phase. Like, there's a lot. There's a lot you got to think about. It's not just, oh, write a grant and we get the money. Or, there are different right. types of grants and the, the, the funds can be disseminated in different ways. Right. So. Okay. Governance is next. I think somebody was ready to get to this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm and I'm gonna try to keep it real brief. Um <laughs> I am just I'm so big on yeah, like talkers, the board. So nothing is brief in here. here. <laughs> um I know we're having a little trouble with the brief. <laughs> <laughs> I um what I see a lot of is number one board of directors consists of friends and family members. And I think that that is so that, you know, everybody is a yes man. Mm -hmm. No one's going to challenge you. No one's going to, you know, everyone's a yes man. That's um, avoiding accountability to me. Um, you have a board full of friends and family members because no one's going to hold you accountable. And I tell everybody, like, the board of directors is the backbone of an organization. The strength of the organization lies in the strength of the board of directors. Um, I just, and, and I just feel like board training is important. Mm -hmm. um, board development is important. Doing annual trainings, biannual trainings, because not everyone that steps into these positions you know, a lot of people, this is their first time. So they don't know how to be a president or a treasurer. Right. I also think that founders who are presidents uh -huh. have to learn when to take their hands out of the oh, yeah. That is a hard thing called founder yeah. syndrome. And no, they can't be presidents. Like, that doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> I would never work with an organization where the founder decides that they wanted to be president of the board. Like, I don't yeah, have I wish I started out like that, but I didn't. Like, for, for all of my, um, up until about six months ago, all of the founders. Are presidents and some of them have yeah some of them have strong boards but they have control issues so 
you know, none of the board, very few of the boards are actual functioning boards. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't know who that they was. They are doing this at formation. I, I mean, most of my new clients who were already formed when they got to me are president are president of their board or work. I've told me, and some of them I've asked to get off the board, they still won't get off. And they do it because they want control of the board. Well, and control doesn't work in a nonprofit. Right? If you want control, you need to start an LLC. Exactly. <laughs> right. and, not a non-profit. They really, they really feel like it looks bad. when you're when you're applying for funding as well, they they really feel like for your board, right? Founder. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a mess. I just have a connection. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's a whole entire mess, um, and I think the root of the problem, um, like Latinisha was saying starts at the very beginning. At least that's how I like to put it. It starts with the planting of the seed. So when you reached out to yeah. people to become board members, because you yourself were not educated enough on the board, you did not know what to tell the people becoming board members. So they came in under the premise yeah. of one thing. And then when they got in there, they realized it's something completely different. And um, then that's where the chaos starts. Um, the other thing is when you, I can't remember who said it, that sometimes um, people come into the nonprofit and they've already been board members on other boards before. But what I have found in my, <laughs> in a lot of situations, because they have sat on other boards, um, maybe two or three times before, doesn't make them any more knowledgeable than yeah. someone coming in for the first time. Because again, how you did it over there isn't necessarily the right way to do it. So yeah. they're, they may have been on a board that was dysfunctional or they were not following best practices. So now they come over here and maybe this board is following best practices and they go, oh, well, that's not how we used to do it. I don't understand why you're doing that, you know, because they were on a dysfunctional board before, even though they've been consistent board members in another organization. So yes, initial board training when they come on is necessary and biannual, annual training. I always think that board members should have a retreat, all that should be in the budget, but this is why you need development, first of all, because you need to figure out how you're going to get to that you know those, those monies to do all of this stuff I, so. I, i've got a little something to add i didn't think i did but i got a little bit to add. <laughs> <laughs> um some some things that i've run into is mm -hmm. um people many grants ask for a board list mm -hmm. a minute board list mm -hmm. and people do not have them mm -hmm. right um Many grants will ask you, how often do your, does your board meet? <laughs> and people aren't having meetings. We, we met last year sometime. Right. Yeah. So, you know what? That's so one of the, thing on this when, when you're saying that, one of the things that I tell <laughs> um, you and nonprofits that they need to do is put together a board package. Yes. Okay? Yeah. You need a packet. And so a there should be a checklist. <laughs> Of all the, things, the signed documents and everything. And one of the things that should be in that packet is um, resumes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that, I was getting to that yep. one. <laughs> resumes. <laughs> yes. And resumes. So, uh -huh. You should have a resume, an updated resume for uh -huh. everybody if you are even mm -hmm. thinking about yep. maybe sometime applying for a grant. Right. They're mm -hmm. going to ask for them. Uh -huh. mm -hmm resumes and grants and this is what this is the crazy thing right because and I'm, I'm refer another important one too for federal funding for example when you're speaking of resumes and grants you know cvs bios whatever mm -hmm. these these people who are putting them to positions you're like oh, this is going to be my program director or this is the executive director and you're applying for a, a you know a four million dollar grant where somebody who is going to be in the position of program director needs to know how to do whatever it is the program director is supposed to do. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> into the, you know, into the, into the grant. Yeah. And, and her resume says that she 
doesn't know how to do anything. She hadn't had a job since 1983, and that was in the daycare. Yeah. Or she's now, worked in a completely different industry, has right. nothing to do with what she's doing. Yeah. What you're doing. No <laughs> crossover <laughs> skills, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Well, and, and this, go ahead. No, I, I also run across, even when I, when I do get a resume and I look at the resume, because that is part of my job, I don't just have you send me documents, but I actually look at them and think about how this fits into the picture. When I get the resume, the fact that they're your board member is not even on their resume. <laughs> and yeah. I understand that people are just not thinking about these things, but this is why we're here to talk about these things, because these things really do matter. One thing, um, as you know, as far as grant writing go, it is technical writing. It means we take big ideas and make them sm into small, tiny pieces mm -hmm. that are easy to understand and easy to explain. Yeah. And so when somebody is reviewing that grant, they are looking at those little, tiny, itsy mm -hmm. bitsy things, and that complete proposal has got to fit together. It's got to mesh. So if you told a lie in the beginning, it's going to catch up with <laughs> you. Like the come back. It's, it's all got to be. You the lie, friend. You ain't got the lie. I know, right? <laughs> you ain't got okay. the lie. <laughs> we ready for the next one? <laughs> yeah, because we could, there's still so much we could discuss. Oh, about. I have one more thing. I just have uh, one more thing mm -hmm. about the board. It's just important that the board is committed. Um, I know a lot of people yeah. um, like board giving funders look for that. And I think people don't even realize, but it's, well, you know, talk about that all the time. Go out and fundraise, you're going out asking people for money, but you yourself yep. aren't making a financial contribution. <laughs> like board commitment all is out. important <laughs> and it is required. That's all I want to say. <laughs> I say that all the time. Like, I'm always on my soapbox about that. I'm like, yeah. how can you ask other people to donate to your organization when the people making the rules for your organization exactly. are not doing the same? They should be the exactly. first people to, to donate to the organization. Call it dues, call exactly. it donations, whatever word you want to put on it, donor giving, whatever you, I mean, um, board something. giving. I don't care what they need to yeah. give. They should be yeah. the first people to give to the organization. It needs to be part of their contract. As far as I'm concerned, when I do contract for boards, I write it in. This is how much you need to give every year. And it increases by this amount as the years go by. This is how much you need to, uh, in personal fundraising amounts, that you need to gather every year. This has nothing to do with the organization's fundraising efforts. This right. is your fundraising efforts. You need to reach out to your um, um, network and get this money in for us. So, yeah. What's the All right. Because we can yeah. keep going. What, but what, we're going to move on. <laughs> let's, let's take the question. Someone has a question. Oh, she wants to know if she's going to um, be able to get a copy of... No, no, there was another oh, one. Oh, no, there's another one? She said, what if I'm the only... If I'm the only one who knows what I want to do in the nonprofit... Why shouldn't I serve as president until I get someone on the same page as me? Don't be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> you should not be the only person. Like, yeah, guys, just leave me out here by myself, right? Okay. I can see how you all are. Um, <laughs> you okay. should never so be first the of all, person. you should not yeah. be the only person in your organization yeah. that knows what you want to do. Yeah. Before you start your an organization, plan. you should have been recruiting board members and telling them what you wanted to do yeah. and making sure that they have bought in to your mission. Before you start. Before you even started. So if you have already started and you, um, well, you're not working in compliance, first of all. Right. If yeah. you don't have a board, you're not working in compliance. So you have got to stop, take some several steps back, and you now need to go find yourself three board members. Yeah, so the minimum is network, not your friends, not your family, but three board members who are going to make three to five. I like five, but I, I like forty. Two. Um, five is my ideal number. Not nine and ten, and you know, odd well, numbers, but not fifteen. Those numbers. Yeah. Not <laughs> I like five. You need to go out and at least find three people 
network with three people. So I don't know what type of industry you're in, like what, what services you offer to the community, but like I always use schools because that's my thing. Um, so um, <laughs> if you were having an after school program, you would at least want a teacher or an assistant principal or principal on your board. Um, you may want a parent because you have to represent the community that you're serving. So you may want a parent from the community on your board. Now this parent may not be able to give the $500, which is my minimum I think board members should give, but then she may have to work that off in some other way. You know what I mean? But she has to give back to the organization in some way. So a parent, and then you may want somebody like a pediatric nurse or a pediatrician or somebody like that. Some people who are well-connected <clears throat> in the community, people who can get you make M roads um, for you within the um, community that you're serving. And they have a network of people that they can tap into to help um, fund your mission vision as well. Yeah. yeah. And what was it, Patricia? Yes, that's, that's why you're here. We're glad you're here. Yeah. So you can ask the questions. And you got them. And one of them needs to be board president instead of you. <laughs> that's just, yeah. that's just, and that whole buy-in starts with you doing your research uh -huh. about, yeah. about the population and about the needs of yeah. the population in your area so that you could sell them on whatever the concept is that you have right. about. Yeah. So you have to be able to communicate with them and to get them to jump on to your vision of the organization. And yeah. you're going to be stuck with them for at least a little bit. So you may as well get some people that you yeah. really want to work with. Right. And that's why you can't work out of a place of desperation. You have to work from a place of... Um, you got to have the structure. You yeah. Have to, you have to you build slowly. So you can't want, to, want it to happen right away. You have to take your time and network with a lot of people. And kiss, well, I like to say, kiss a lot of frogs before you get to the prince and well, the princess. <laughs> <You know? laughs> kiss a lot of frogs. So you're going to talk, when I say that, I mean, you're going to talk to a lot of people who you think it could be potential board members because you're really putting them through like an interview type process. You know, you're going to ask them questions. You're going to tell them about your, um, your mission and vision. And then you're going to ask them questions based on your mission and vision to see if they're really invested. Because for a lot of people, being a board, being on a board is a, something of prestige. So they like to say, mm -hmm. oh, well, I sit on a nonprofit board. I, I see people like, they like light up and they're all like, <laughs> you know, all the time. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> you know, so you want to make sure you're <laughs> those people who are just there just to say that they're there and they're not really there to actually work because that's what happens a lot of people come onto the board and they have no intentions of actually showing up to a meeting after they after you yeah. made them a board member that's it they're gone and they have no connections in the community yeah. they 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 don't have any resources in the community they really can't bring anything to the table so you you want to do your due diligence when you're looking for board members and make sure that they can actually benefit your mission and what mm -hmm. you intend to do and the services you Ask provide. Them Ask them what can they bring to the organization. Yeah. Them, you got to know what your organization is about. So if you don't know the mission, like the back of your hand, if you don't know what is needed in the organization, then asking somebody what they can bring to the organization is not going to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you don't know if they're, you still don't know if they're the right fit. And you, keep, right. you, know, you don't like randomly pick people who are, and I always say people, they have to be committed, they have to be connected, they have to be competent, they have to be willing to contribute. And when I'm saying committed, I'm not saying committed to you, which is what you find with your family and your friends. They're committed to you. They're not exactly. committed to the, they're not committed to the organization. Right. And so in, in, when you're she's asking the question about being the president, you know, if at some point you're going to want to get paid anyway, right? So you're, you're causing all kinds of problems when you're the, you're the president of the board, yeah, but this is a volunteer board, so volunteers don't get paid, right? So that's strike one, you know, against you as the president. And then you create this, you create this atmosphere within the organization where they're kind of your board and everybody else is kind of thinking that of you as really kind of a fierce kind of thing. They're scared to do things, they're scared to drive your mission. The board is supposed to help move your organization forward, 
even if you're not really feeling it because it's not about you it's for the people right. about the they may have some ideas and they may want to move in the school direction but they're afraid to communicate with you because you're the president you're the executive director you're the secretary you the, the program you manager <laughs> <laughs> everything <laughs> you wear all the hats i mean some people have to start in that in that place unfortunately they've already <laughs> they've already gotten started and that's where they're at so we're not we're not trying to pick fun at anybody but we want to make sure everybody's informed and understand why these are don't put you in the best positions mm -hmm. Um, I'm almost afraid of the next topic because it's kind of one of my soapboxes and I think it's ties too. So, and we already talking too much. Did, I don't know, I don't know how to sound. I'm about to go. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about 30 minutes and we still got a little bit more to go. Mm -hmm. We got a lot more to go. <laughs> yeah, is program development. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, That's where the you, can't, at. you can't call me at, mm -hmm. at whether it's for nonprofit things or grant writing, whatever you may be calling me for, you can't call me to do much of anything for you if you don't have a program. Right. And activities are not the same thing as programs. <laughs> I'm trying to make this I as concise as I can. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so we need to have an understanding of what we actually want to do how we're going to do it, who we're uh -huh. going to do it with. That I call it the who, what, when, where, why, and how. You need right. to know that about what you intend to do in the community, what services you intend to provide. You have, you've got to have that. You, you really are not doing anything if you don't have a program. Right. Now, that doesn't mean if you have activities that those are not worthwhile. There are activities that are worthwhile. But if you're looking for to show impact, if you're looking to prove that you're that you are doing good in whatever area that you're working in, you need to have some kind of program structure. Right. And uh, on a basic level, I'm going to say that again: who, what, when, where, why, and how. Mm -hmm. If you can answer those basic questions, then you have a place to start with what this program is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But people often call all of us because we talk enough to, <laughs> and I know this. <laughs> that they call us and they want a grant written or they want to do a fundraiser or they need something mm -hmm. and they have, well, what days of the week are you going to do? Uh, are you going to do this? Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe Tuesday mm -hmm. or and Friday. Probably Friday wait, night. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> what days of the week are you going to do it? What time of day are you? Oh, I'm going to do it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. With, with, and why? Uh, school age like, children why, why like you gotta have an idea of mm -hmm. how you're really gonna do this yeah. and that goes back to something we talked about earlier is knowing your population mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. got to do your homework on your population yep. just because i'm i'm black doesn't mean i know the black community in and out exactly. and and there's lots of sub populations within yes. any community and people have they People are people, they have all of these differences and they make different decisions and they have different behaviors. So you have to do your homework. And that mm -hmm. way you won't be designing a program that nobody's gonna come to because exactly. nobody needs it. If you mm -hmm. thought it was a good idea, but you didn't think it through. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's really important to have an understanding of what you really want to do in great mm -hmm. detail. Mm -hmm. I like okay. to tell people it's systems, processes, and evaluation. Yeah. Systems, processes, and evaluation. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And how are you going to evaluate that it was even done and done effectively? <laughs> you know, um, nothing happens without that. And you don't have it, you get no money. <laughs> That's right. it. Without and you're not going to have get get any money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything starts research, and I think that. We a lot of times we just want to miss that piece. We just want to jump in. Yeah. And we want to just do something, you know. And it's like, oh, you event yourself to death. It's like an event every dang on weekend. You got an event. Like, uh, what is this about? What kind of impact is this making? And then you really feel like you're create like it's a program because you're doing it so often. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, well, we got an event. We got an event next Friday. We got an event. Um, we got a back to school rally. We got a, a, a workshop. And but you're not stringing it together, right? It has to fit together, 
Mm-hmm. They all have to come together for one outcome that you're looking for. Right. Right. What's the outcome and what impact are you making when you're talking in, you know, like logic models and, and what goes into it? What is the process? And then you answer all these questions in the process. You know, what, what are you doing? Who are you doing for? Why are you doing it? And making all this stuff fit. Not when I, when I teach programs, I talk about the fact that everything you do, because for most people, the hardest part of a proposal or the problem that like, like it's easiest to find out where you miss the mark at is when you go into the budget, right? And it's like, oh my God, this stuff all adds up. We don't know where that came from. Where did Mira come from over here in this budget? We don't even know, you know? But if you had your, if your program is together and you know exactly what you are doing and you figure out what your inputs are, what is everything that I need to make this program work? Every one of these things is gonna show up somewhere in your budget. And then you have the process, are we gonna do this for two weeks? Well, how much money is it gonna take to invest in this for two weeks? Are we gonna, do we need a, a facility? Are we gonna need some books? Right. Yeah, everything's going to show up in the end piece. And what kind of impact am I going to make? If I'm making a million dollar impact, but my budget is $400 and you're the only one I'm asking for funding, you ain't going to, we already know you ain't doing this right. Because this, right. this, this is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk that. about this for days. But yeah. you know, again, people it's don't know. <laughs> and you know, you could give me a topic right now and I probably could run off a quick list of things inputs that i need to put into something to accomplish whatever it is but it just yesterday somebody called me they were talking to me about a grant that the organization got and they were talking about the fact that they got this was a multi-million and they're um, working in underserved communities and they've got all these They've got several programs linked to each other and activities within those programs where they're asking people to come to workshops and educational events. And there's no money for transportation and people mm -hmm. are have, would have to come from miles around. So my point is you have to think about who you are serving and then think again in great detail about how you're going to serve them. Exactly. Those $4 million dollars are gonna they they may be just uh useless really because mm -hmm. you you forgot about the main thing if you're working with an underserved served population and you want them to come to all these things how are they going to get there we we know and that you know transportation is is a huge barrier so that just means you didn't think about your program well mm -hmm. enough and sometimes I mean, that happens because grant writers are not always money. program people and some mm -hmm. organizations and they're writing these things. <laughs> right, yeah, and sometimes important. too, you may need to go back and do some market research to find out exactly how the community wants the services that you're thinking about offering yeah. to them. What do they and, need that accompanies that service? So like you said, they're, um, they're do doing these workshops, people are from all miles around. If they had done a little survey you know, right. and ask about transportation needs and whatever, that could have been circumvented from the very beginning. You know, right. it's all about. You know, <laughs> and that budget, that grant you budget. You can't have enough, in, yeah, you can't have enough um, data in a nonprofit, especially when you're dealing with grant monies. Yes. You know. And the wild part of, about what you were saying about the, like for the presentation piece that was missing, the reporting, if they have, like, if they have to report, why didn't, why didn't you serve 500 people in six weeks? <laughs> Said you were going to serve, and you go, Well, they couldn't get here, right? So you have to lie to the finder, you know, why Why this didn't happen? And you go, Oh, I forgot that they didn't, they didn't yeah, lie. Didn't that. <laughs> you know, so you got, and, and, a, and sometimes, depending on the funder, they, they really question, You know, why yeah. didn't you spend this money? Or this, you know, why didn't you get these service numbers that you said you were going to get? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of them don't care, they, they don't want to know, they don't, <laughs> they, they may. They'll like, they're gonna ask you why, but mm -hmm. you're not gonna give them a good enough reason. There is mm -hmm. not gonna be a reason that's good <laughs> enough to explain why you haven't done what you said you were gonna do in this right. process. Yep. And then you have created a whole new problem for yourself. Right. Because your likelihood of getting um the grant again is probably zero. Right, exactly. <laughs> and the likelihood that they may pull the funding before the grant period even ends. 
Yeah. yeah. They, they that can too. do that if they people want don't to. Know that. There are people Talk that, that really don't believe don't that. that. There are people that really <laughs> do not believe that they can pull their funding uh-huh. back. Yes. And ask you to pay it back. <laughs> right. And like again, that it goes back to that report that most people don't know they need to write. And you're not just writing that report because it depends. That's why you got to read the RFP. You have to read it, <laughs> you know, because it may ask for a mid report or it may ask for a report every two months or whatever. Yes. The founder wants. So sometimes, like I said, you need someone to just manage the grants because the program director cannot do it all. Yes. And you sometimes, know? sometimes the lower the grant funding that you get, the, the more harassment you get. <laughs> The I something the other day and I said the, <laughs> the only way they'll get those reports done is if they use the grant funding that they got to pay the staff to do the reporting because it mm-hmm. there was no way they were getting anything done besides doing the reports with the right. amount of money that they got mm-hmm. so being reading the RFP and the instructions and being realistic about what you can do right. from from the jump Mm-hmm. from day one you got to be really real realistic don't embellish any of your capabilities no. because it will come back and bite you yes it will i okay. think we can skip the other parts with the consultant and go on to the the volunteer just okay. because you know we're kind of short on time <laughs> we're talking too much yeah okay um the volunteer recruitment and management mm-hmm. You start, you're going to start with that? Sure. So volunteer recruitment and management. So just like we said that um, grants are not free, neither are volunteers. So it's a common misconception that, ooh, I'm just going to get me some volunteers and I don't have to pay anybody and things are great. Um, But in reality, if you're going to have a, flourishing um, volunteer department within your nonprofit organization, you need to take time to recruit these volunteers. Time is money, right? So you're going to have to do some networking again, because networking is king and queen in the nonprofit um, realm. You have got to network, right? So you're going to need to take time to um, network and recruit volunteers, interview these volunteers, and train these volunteers. And then while they're on staff, you're going to have to manage these volunteers because you need to make sure that they're following protocol. Whatever your rules and regulations and the way you do things within your organization, you have to know if they're not because you're legally responsible for them. So if they do something, if you're after school program again. So if you're doing an after school program and you have a volunteer that is mistreating a child, you didn't know about it, you, you're liable. Background screen. Right, you're liable. <laughs> so there's a lot of processes that go into having a successful volunteer um, a group within your organization. So do not think that having volunteers is free. If you're going to do it right, it's going to cost you a lot of time, okay? And don't treat your volunteers like they're peons. You want to treat your volunteers like the professionals that they are or the professionals that you have trained them to become, right? You want to make sure that you're not paying them, but you want to make sure that you recognize the good work that they have done for your organization to help you succeed at your mission. Because without the volunteers, you will not be able to accomplish your mission. So if you have an after-school program, you have a retired teacher that's coming in three days a week, you know, for four hours to help you out with that program, think about it in the form of money. How much would you have had to pay a teacher to actually come in and do that job? So when you think about it that way, then you become more appreciative of that person's volunteer services. You realize how much money that person was able to save you versus what you having to pay somebody else. So you should have volunteer appreciation times for your um for your volunteers, you know, have a party, that type of stuff and show them, give them awards and that type of stuff to let them know that you're truly you truly truly appreciate them coming in 
and providing a service for your organization because they don't have to. They can stay home and watch Netflix and chill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I do a lot of volunteering and um, the day that they think that um, they can take me for granted is the day I'm going to come home and put my phone up. Yeah. It's just what it is. And, oh, big point. Volunteering for most people, and the reason why some nonprofit organizations cannot get volunteers is because they cannot sell people on volunteering for their nonprofit, right? Because you're not selling them on the value of volunteering. So it's not... So people take volunteers and they bring them in and they want to give them all the jobs and all the tasks that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it's supposed to be about. It's like having an intern and you think that your intern is just going to go get you coffee and um, file some paperwork for you all day. That is illegal <laughs> according to labor standards. That's not what interns do and that's not how you should be using your volunteers either you're supposed to be selling them on the va the value of volunteering because believe it or not a lot of people have used and can use and which a lot of people don't know so here's a nice little tidbit for the founders and for people who are volunteering here's a way you can sell them on volunteering do you know that if someone volunteers for your organization so let's say a parent someone who's using the services of your organization and maybe you needed a receptionist and that person comes in three, four days a week for four hours and they act as your receptionist. Do you know they can take that, um, that volunteering experience and add it to their resume as work experience and get a better paying job? If someone comes in and they're doing all of your website stuff for you and they're doing a good job at it, you can give them a letter of recommendation. They can add the, um, the duties that they did in your organization to their resume, and they can now go out and get a paid job doing what they did as a volunteer. So a lot of people can use volunteering as a stepping stone to a higher paying job, to a new, new job um, skills, you know. So think about it that way. You have to sell people on volunteering for your organization. Because a lot of people will just prefer to be at home and put their feet up, honestly. Or go volunteer somewhere else. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be appreciated. Oh, right? yeah. mm -hmm. oh, I think I covered it all. Oh, wow. Okay. You sell them on, uh, on a sob story and you sell them on the bad stuff. And you try to, if you tell, you tell them about, how poor you need somebody to help me. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, please help me because we're gonna, you know, we're gonna close our doors so we don't have enough. People don't want to put up for your, you know, for your burdens because they got enough going on personally themselves. Right. When you're, like you were saying before, when you're approaching people, um, even to partner with you or to, to be volunteer, you got to tell them about the good stuff. You got to tell them. I mean, not a lot to them, you know, of course, but you don't want to lead in with saying, oh, we're just. We just bad free because mess. Yeah. <laughs> because nobody really has that kind of energy to, to pull to, to resuscitate you. So you have right. to have to lead in what you know, what kind of impact are we making and how do you add to this to uh -huh. the good that we're doing? Because right. a lot of times when they don't have if, if it's not about the money, because it has to be about if it ain't about the money, what else is it about, right? Uh -huh. So you have doing something that makes me feel good, you know, that's, that's making me think I'm serving a, a higher purpose or whatever, because you ain't paying me. So All I've right. got to have, you know, this, you know, the resume, or if it's something that I just wanted to give back to the community to make myself feel better, you mm -hmm. got to invite an atmosphere that's going to be a positive one, and not one that's, you know, you talk about me to help. Can you volunteer to be on my board, but I hate my board members, and we're already fighting and whatever. So I, I don't want to be on your board, right? <laughs> Right. Folks don't like you, so I may not like you either. So you want to make sure that when you have that conversation and you start being visible and communicating, that you share the good that you are doing. Because when you're doing good, other people want to be a part of that. Exactly, exactly. Because nobody really does anything for nothing. Uh, right. No matter how much anybody tells you that, it's a lie. Yes. No yeah. one, and okay. I mean no one, yeah. does anything <laughs> for nothing. Everybody does something with some type of ulterior motive. 
whether they want to admit it consciously or subconsciously, it is being done for a reason. Right. This is kind of human nature. People exactly. People do things for nothing. Even right. if that, even though if the something is still something good, mm -hmm. you know, what mm -hmm. motivates people is, is their feelings their, or, you know, monetary benefit. You know, exactly. Exactly. People are motivated in some kind of way to do what they do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we had covered most of the stuff on partnership in our a yeah, previous yeah. topic. So we can skip that one and go down to, I guess, strategic planning. Yep. Did you want, I think that's your, your thing too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So strategic planning. So earlier I talked about the business plan and how it's the mother of the plans. So the strategic plan is the father of the plans for which all other children are born, right? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the strategic plan is a step-by-step -step process of how you're going to get through your nonprofit building, you know, building out and accomplishing your mission and getting closer and closer to that vision. So usually the strategic plan is over a three-year period. And I like to say, um, you can kind of chunk year number two and year number three together if you're doing it yourself. If I'm doing it for somebody, I break it down all the way to year number three. But definitely in year number one, you want to break it down first by what your goals are each month for the year. Um, you have your three main goals. You break those three main goals down into how you're going to get them month by month throughout the year. Then, of course, weekly and who's going to be responsible for the um, for the task, um, how long they have to accomplish the task, and what they're going to use as an evaluation tool to make sure that task was accomplished. So the strategic plan is like, the, so one would be the roadmap, and then the other one would be the GPS, <laughs> right? So I guess the business plan is like the roadmap, you know, back in the day when you were going on a trip, Somebody sat in the front seat with the map and they were like, okay, well, we got to go here, 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 here. That's kind of like the business plan. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you have the strategic plan, which takes the um, fundamentals from the business plan and breaks it down even further. So now you got the GPS. So Siri's telling you to turn right, turn left. No, you need to, you know, do a U-turn. That's kind of what the strategic plan does for you. So it's that they're both fluid documents. I don't want to think you to think that you're writing your business plan and then that's it, or you're writing your strategic plan or your development. None of your plans are concrete. They're right. all very that's fluid that's documents. Changing. They change as your organization changes. They change as you get money sometimes unexpectedly, or you don't get it. You know, like maybe you wrote a grant and you're like, yeah, so we got this. And then bam, something happens, the company folds, whatever. And you don't get it. You still, you got to go back and you got to update it because now things are changing. Monies that you thought you had to spend, you no longer had to spend or monies that you didn't know you were going to have to spend you have to spend so you can implement a new program or a service or you know buy more stuff for existing program or service so they're all very fluid documents that you need to revisit on a regular basis with your board i was just about to say and just make sure that this, this should be a team effort if you plan a strategic strategies need to be a team effort nobody should be sitting down by themselves writing a strategic plan uh -uh. for the organization. Even if you hire a consultant, oh, sorry. Even yeah. if you hire a consultant, the cons consultant needs to be with you and you as the ED, because most of most founders are EDs. So you <laughs> and your board to sort through this strategic plan. Even if the, the, the consultant writes the plan out, it still needs to go to you, the ED and the board. You got to sit down, go through it, make any corrections and adjustments, and it goes back to the consultant. She revises it or he revises it or whatever, and then it goes back again. So it's a, it's a continuous process. Yeah. At least that's how I do mine. <laughs> that's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Have to pay thousands of dollars, you know, to do the plan. I couldn't hear you. You know, <laughs> sorry. Make sure you implement the strategic plan, okay. not just write it. Exactly. <laughs> Consultants 
guitar is a, a nice, I, I think a nice penny for strategic plan. Because and it's, it's, not, it's how you're you going to make your money. Yeah. So you have to pay for it. You know, I don't touch a strategic plan on the $2,500 and that's it. You know, involved. they're involved and in they're time intensive. Mm -hmm. By the time you're finished writing that document, you probably got like 10 pages. Easily. Yeah. Easily 10 pages. 10 pages of a whole lot yeah. of thinking and rethinking. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So. And people still don't want to pay for it. <laughs> and people really don't want to pay. I, mean, I know, I know, I know. I, know. I think people sometimes are convinced yeah. that they can, you know, humans are, we're talking about human beings. We all think at some point in some situations we, that we can skip a step. We can jump yeah. over that. We can yeah. do, you know, we can do it this way. We can change the recipe and still get the same outcome. But this I is, this, uh -uh. this is a real, <laughs> these are all really delicate things that link to each other. Yeah. I don't know right. who came up with the first nonprofit and I don't know how it, how it looked back. Churches then. back in the 1700s. <laughs> <thing about, laughs> one thing about them is if you mess up in one place, it's going to it's going to trickle over to, to some other area. It These will. things mm -hmm. have to be connected and mm -hmm. you have to be looking at things from the big picture and then bring it all, all the way down to the app. Mm -hmm. you know, you mm -hmm. These things have to go together and really I, skip the right. steps. Is if you have these idea. things in place, when you hire a grant writer, it makes the grant writer's job so much. Um, it is such a difference. Okay. Such so much difference. easier. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to stop there. People are, people are, people are applying, wanting, wanting to do, you know, sponsorship, fundraising, everything. And one of the, all the questions, do you have a business plan? Nope. Do you have a business plan? Nope. Do you have, like, you have nothing at all. <laughs> Does you okay. want a grant, fundraiser? You know, you got to write this stuff. You get, and, it's, and write it down. It's got to be written down. Yeah. Okay, we got we have like three minutes now. Um, I'm, I'm gonna quickly just make some points about data. I'm, I like um, people to have data. It, we need to know how many people you served. We need to know how many women, how many men, how many children, how many boys, girls, mm -hmm. elderly people, people with specific specific diseases or disorders or mm -hmm. certain behaviors. Keep data on the people that you're serving and that you're seeing. Make sure you keep good records. Mm -hmm. Be able to go put your finger on how many people you served this year, last mm -hmm. year. You know, make sure you can you can pull that information when it's asked for. Mm -hmm. Keep it organized. Understand the difference between duplicated and unduplicated um, service provisions. So some people may come mm -hmm. to your organization multiple times. Some may come for one time. Mm -hmm. So if a duplicated person would be somebody who would come multiple times, mm -hmm. and if some grantors and funders only want to know who you served that one time mm -hmm. even if they keep coming back they count as one time so that's the difference between duplicated and unduplicated um and then i think we just have some slides with our information but do we want to try to take a question or see if there are questions yeah you can oh <clears throat> like my Phone is dying. Does anyone have any questions? I don't know. Want to ask? No. I don't have a question. I'm not. Sorry. I want to say something. <laughs> I want to say something about what Rocky just said about duplication of service. You also need to know, um, you know, what kind of funding you have, and whether or not another organization in your area has that same type of funding, because yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm you're not allowed to provide the same service that they're providing because the funder right. accounts that educational service so you have to ask right. exactly. whether or not to receive that service somewhere else yep okay so let me share all right can you guys see my screen yep yes okay so um my academy is called how do i get rid of this bar can i get rid of this bar <clears throat> oh yeah there you go <laughs> um it's called tba consult uh, tba academy um and you can go on here it's at bit.ly 
uh, TVA Academy, and these are the current courses that you can take right now. Um, I'm always adding courses because I am, um, that's just kind of what I do. I make courses. <laughs> You know, coming from a teacher's background, I just like to write curriculums so, and teach stuff. So these are the current courses that I offer. Again, you can go to bit.ly um, TV Academy and sign up and take a course and get some much needed education so that you can be successful in 2019 because you need to fill that knowledge gap. All right, Ty. Um, this is my finally funded nonprofit membership group level four. There are actually four levels um, to the group. This is the beginner's level at $31 a month. It gives you access to the private uh, nonprofit development community where we we're just kind of in there really learning about fund development, what it takes to get in position for funding, how to strengthen your organization from the bottom up, um, weekly training partnership training, uh, peer support and accountability. Most of the people there really love the, the peer support and the do-it-yourself resources and templates that we have in there. Um, again, all about fund development, everything from budget and your ask and um, just how to prepare your organization for the next level. That's level four. And that's the only one that I'm promoting tonight, level four, the beginning level. Website, uh, type of enterprise.com slash finally funded or you can visit the billy link at finally funded level four all right and then one next Vanessa, let me see if i can pull this up on a slide that can show okay all right i had to be different yeah <laughs> You didn't have to admit that. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm not seeing it. But you anyway, is it, it's, it's up? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't um, so. You don't see it? No. Mm -hmm. no? Oh, is it because, okay, I might may need to Got share it. this particular yeah. screen. Mm -hmm um you share so what, what what tracy's trying to pull up is um some of our newer offerings um is what i've chosen to show you guys today um we have recently started a you can video library that? yep there it is a video library with all sorts of grant writing topics um and in the video library you can rent individual videos based on the topic that you feel you need to know the most about and I tried to make every video straight to the point and to answer the most common questions and sometimes the most unusual question or hard to find the answer to type questions. Um, so you can go to the video library and rent individual videos, you can rent entire modules, or you can rent all of the modules. And then we also have some packages that also include meeting with me one on one um, on a weekly basis if you buy a subscription to um, the video library. And then we also have some consulting packages that are, um, one is designed for people who are new or have never written grants before because there are some organizations that are really old but they've never written a grant. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, you want to get yourself to a place of being uh, grant ready, we have a consulting package for that. And then we also have a consulting package for program design. And I'm working on some other packages, but that's what I like to feature tonight. The website is volcanoconsulting.com. Okay. It's red box for grant writing. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go back. I like that ring, that ring part. I like it. Okay. Um, so services that I specialize in are listed, um, grants readiness is a big one. Um, of course, developing board, um, management and training and working with ministries and churches. Um, I'm available as you can see for training and development workshops, conferences, or one-on-one -on -one individual consulting. Um, the email address below, latanisha at latanisharoberts.com. The web link on the website will be live mid-January. 
All right. Do we have any last words? That went by really fast. <laughs> <laughs> we can really talk. <laughs> I think it was needed then, though. It was a good discussion. Yes, I think productive. it was great. It was awesome. Yeah. And, and I hope that everybody who was here would think it was good too. Um, oh, you're breaking up, not Tanisha. Yeah. You broke no, was, up. I'm sorry. I was just saying we could easily do a part two, I know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we swear not because we, we didn't so much. Thank you. Yeah. Patricia. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. I'm glad that you like. Please go to everybody's website and join their list, their email list, uh -huh. so that you can know when we're doing something like this again. It may not be two hours every time. Um, right. But we really wanted to get it in at the end of the year. Um, but we do absolutely int intend to do lots more of this. So make sure you go to all of the websites and sign up for the email list. Mm -hmm. And ask us about our services if you're interested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think everybody's on Facebook, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and Instagram. Yep. Okay. So yeah, we about Facebook, the Instagram, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. And all on LinkedIn. So you can find us. We're easy to find. Easy to find. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, and there's somebody just asked about the recording. Um I think we're well, all going to have we're all going to post it on our website. Right. So yeah. Can... It'll be on our all our individual websites. Okay. Um, Mine will probably I be on think two media. hours, it will be too much to put up on Facebook. Facebook has oh. a, like a limit. Yeah. Um I may be able to share the link on Facebook, but not the actual video you'd have to go okay. to our websites to see that or send it out in an email list or something yeah okay all right all right all it was right. great this is great so much for <laughs> joining me thank you, thank you. all right all right bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.